initiatives that are often used in private industry. These expenses total about $1.6 billion annually. If the Postal Service could adopt some of the best practices used by private sector, the OIG estimates that potential savings are over $300 million annually. Furthermore, as if this wasn't enough, under GAAP, the reported workers' comp liabilities on the books are adjusted by changes in interest rates. In the first quarter of 2024, it resulted in a non-cash expense of $1.2 billion. And I, and I urge you to read another report from the OIG of May 26, 2023, that goes into great detail as to this, frankly, travesty. Now, these are complex issues, they're, but they're critical to evaluating the Postal Service's financial performance. In closing, while our finances have improved, as shown in the first quarter, we estimate a full year controllable loss of 800 million, but that is down from 2.3 billion loss in 2023. And by the way, in the, over the last two or three years, not only have inflation hurt our pension returns because of the negative real rates, but also it has impacted our operating results in a tremendous way. 70% of our costs are salary and benefits, and they're subject to COLA adjustments. Another 10% are transportation costs, and they're subject to inflation, as we all know, from fuel prices. And we've been fighting that. And this, inc and, and this result that I've cited, which is an improvement, have taken into account dealing with those inflationary impacts. As I noted earlier, in implementing a restructuring of this magnitude, there will be times when serv service falls short of our standards. But the Postal Service will move quickly to address them, while our infrastructure is being modernized and our workforce stabilized. Simply put, in my view, the Delivering for America plan is working, but it needs time to achieve its goals. With your help and support, we can continue down this path. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Governor Martinez. Our third witness is uh, Michael Kumbayanda, and he is chairman of the Postal Regulatory Commission, which is the Postal Service's uh, regulator. He has served in that role since uh, January of 2021. He was first appointed to the commission and confirmed by the Senate in January of 19 and was confirmed for a second term in December of 21. Prior to his appointment, he served with the U.S. Postal Service Office uh, of Inspector <coughs> General and the House uh, Oversight uh, Committee. Uh, Mr. Kumbayanda, uh, you are recognized uh, for your opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Paul, and members of the committee. The Postal Regulatory Commission is a micro-agency with a substantial mission, providing transparency and accountability of the U.S. Postal Service. The commission, the commission recently issued its compliance determination for 2023 and will soon issue two more reports. The research is alarming. Service performance, finances, and efficiency are moving in the wrong direction. These findings should raise concerns now with elections scheduled for this fall and mail ballots expected to play a role. In Georgia, Virginia, Texas, and other states, service quality has continued to decline. Individual letters and cards mailed within the Atlanta area, which should arrive in a generous two-day window, met that standard only 16% of the time in March. Atlanta and Richmond have new processing plants un under uh, a 2021 strategy which was meant to make the Postal Service self-sustaining and high-performing. Three years later, the Postal Service does not appear to be closer to meeting those goals. While some disruption should be expected with these network changes, the bottleneck in Georgia does suggest some underlying problems. Hopefully, service in Atlanta is an outlier and will rebound soon, but national service is also subpar and trending in the wrong direction. Some context helps in understanding these service problems. First, the Postal Service has relaxed service standards in recent years, which should make it easier to achieve a high on-time percentage. Second, the official numbers may actually undercount delays experienced by mailers and recipients. The Postal Strategy calls for centralized plants, which increase the time from when a customer gives mail to the Postal Service until the first scan. This can take place in a different state. The Postal Service has also decided to stop picking up mail from some post offices in the evening. The official metrics, therefore, may actually undercount delivery times by days, even when the network is operating smoothly. The Commission is working to understand and address these issues. Some parts of the Postal Strategy do make intuitive sense, especially at first. 
One might assume that lower standards, operational changes, and slower service have allowed the Postal Service to cut spending, improve efficiency, and become self-sustaining. They have not up to this point. Costs have not been reduced even though mail volume has declined. Efficiency fell by a historic amount of 4% last year. In 2020, the Commission changed a price cap established by a postal reform law, which had locked the cap into place for 10 years. That new regulation, as well as a reform law in 2022, provided a boost of over $100 billion to the postal balance sheet. With that help and the new strategy, the Postal Service planned to break even in 2023. Instead, the agency lost over $6 billion with the caveats that Chairman Martinez uh, mentioned this morning. I understand that postal employees are working harder than ever and that postal management remains committed to its present course. The Commission lacks the direct legal authority to stop it. I hope the Postal Service can turn around in its performance, and I encourage its leaders to be transparent with stakeholders, Congress, and oversight bodies as they attempt to do so. Voters and election officials, for example, must know the amount of time needed to deliver ballots. Congress created the advisory opinion process as one venue for such transparency. The Commission relies on stakeholder input and detailed analyses by its staff to understand the impact of network changes. Advisory opinions identify potential concerns and offer recommendations for addressing them. Commission advisory opinions in 2021 and 2022 noted concerns that were not fully addressed. These include the potential for late delivery of medications, unrealistic projections of cost savings, and lack of communication with stakeholders. We have seen these issues pop up again in headlines and in data, as well as in the OIG's recent audit of Richmond. A new advisory opinion makes sense as the Postal Service ramps up the national rollout of new processing plants and transportation options. These changes are clearly having an impact on service. Um, postal leadership has pointed out uh, that the Commission um, has stopped or slowed down Postal Service's work. While I believe the need for oversight is readily apparent, the Commission has actually streamlined regulation to support the postal ecosystem where that's appropriate. Last year, the Commission approved negotiated service agreements, which are specialized contracts between the Postal Service and its customers, in 10 days on average, despite having a staff of fewer than 100 people. That is fast and flexible regulation where it's warranted. The Commission stands ready to work with postal leadership and stakeholders to preserve the postal system consistent with the law and the public interest. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Kumbayanda. Um, our final uh, witness is uh, Tammy Hall. Uh, she is the Inspector General of the U.S. Uh, Postal Service. The, the governors of the Postal Service appointed her to that position in 2018. Prior to her appointment, Ms. Hall served as the Acting Inspector General and the Deputy Inspector General and has served as the OIG since 2005. Ms. Hall, uh, you are recognized for your opening comment. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Paul, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to discuss our work. The Postal Service issued its Delivering for America plan three years ago and is now accelerating network changes across the country. The OIG is committed to keeping pace with these changes and providing robust oversight and transparency. We've completed several audits related to the plan and more are in progress. We're finding that as the Postal Service implements these changes, significant operational issues are arising that affect service to customers and take time to resolve. Our work is showing that better local coordination and execution could likely prevent some of this disruption. Last September, we issued an audit examining the initial sorting and delivery centers, or SNDCs, in Florida, Georgia, Texas, Massachusetts, and New York. Overall, we found these facilities operated successfully, but there were opportunities for improvement. The Postal Service did not communicate sufficiently with high volume customers, often providing information at the last minute. In addition, some facilities opened before renovations were complete, so employees had to work around construction projects. Transportation changes and also delayed delivery to PO Box customers, leading to complaints. The Postal Service launched its first Regional Processing and Distribution Center, or RPNDC, last July at an existing plant in Richmond, Virginia. Our recent audit of the repurposed facility found significant problems. Prior to making changes, the Postal Service had not addressed staffing and other issues that we had raised in our 2021 and 2022 audits of the facility. Transportation planning for the new facility was also insufficient, leading to a 700% increase in extra trips. 
In addition, on the ground operations did not always match the new integrated plan for the Richmond plant and its supporting facilities. This was partly due to inadequate coordination with local management and ongoing changes after the launch. Local management said they did not fully understand the new mail flow within the facility and were not solicited for input. The Postal Service also did not hold public input meetings for the Richmond changes. We examined whether the Postal Service was required to provide public notice and found its policy was unclear. The Postal Service said its decision not to provide public notice complied with its longstanding interpretation of the law, but this interpretation was not documented in policy. Three months after the opening of the RPNDC, the Postal Service made an additional change within the region covered by the Richmond facility. For the first time, it implemented its local transportation optimization initiative. Under this initiative, at some post offices, collection mail received throughout the day is held overnight to reduce the number of trips and associated costs. In the Richmond region, 86% of the affected zip codes were in rural areas, potentially leaving these rural customers with slower service. Following implementation, first class mail on time service performance in the Richmond region dropped about 21 percentage points to 65%. Unfortunately, we cannot isolate how much of the service decline resulted from this initiative compared to other events such as peak season. As the Postal Service expands this transportation initiative to other locations, we will monitor it and other network changes. We have audits currently underway of the rollout of new RPNDCs in Georgia and Oregon and additional SNDCs, and we will evaluate implementation challenges that could both reduce service and increase the risk that the Postal Service may not achieve its potential savings. We also continue to focus on service performance more broadly and recently reviewed clusters of facilities in Missouri, Minnesota, North Dakota, California, and Washington, D.C. to evaluate service issues and recommend solutions. Additionally, following media reports of undelivered packages, we visited a South Houston facility in January and found 384,000 pieces of delayed mail and mostly packages. The Postal Service had moved operations from another plant, but staffing, equipment, and logistics were not aligned with the new workload. Our recent report details these issues. Another critical focus area for us this year is the Postal Service's readiness for the November election, particularly as network changes are made. We plan to release our election mail readiness audit in late summer and will conduct a separate audit of Postal Service ballot processing during the November election. As we did in 2020, OIG auditors and investigators will make hundreds of visits to delivery units and plants around the country to observe operations and flag problems. We want to help ensure the Postal Service continues to deliver for voters. Thank you for the opportunity to share our work, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hall. Well, we have a lot to unpack here, and we uh, look forward to having a, a very open uh, discussion uh, in the time we have uh, remaining uh, to, together. Uh, Postmaster General DeJoy, um, as we have heard and you mentioned and others have heard, uh, uh, the Postal Service made a number of changes in two very large uh, facilities in Richmond, Virginia, uh, as well as Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, unfortunately, the, that implementation, as we heard from Ms. Hall, has uh, caused some problems uh, and service uh, disruptions uh, during that time. I have the chart here for folks uh, who are in the audience. Uh, One-time service declined uh, after the Postal Service implemented changes uh, in Richmond uh, and unfortunately is still unreliable, as you can see from the chart here. Uh, Atlanta is particularly uh, problematic, uh, where we saw service uh, plummet. Uh, in fact, uh, inbound first-class mail has dropped to only 36% on time, 36% on time. Uh, in addition, cost savings uh, have not uh, been realized. Uh, estimated the Richmond facility, for example, incurred about $8 million in unexpected uh, uh, cost as a result of some of these changes. So my question for you, sir, is given, given these service delays and increased cost, um, uh, is the Postal Service still moving forward uh, with these planned network changes? And do uh, you think it's uh, prudent now to perhaps uh, try to evaluate exactly what happened in these two locations to make any changes that may be necessary before you continue to roll it out on a nationwide basis? Yes, first of all, uh, you know, you're correct in regards to uh, the service uh, deteriorating. We recognize that. We apologize to the uh, 
uh, constituents that have received that service. But in the long term, if we don't make these changes, that will be every day, everywhere around the nation. Uh, the, the problems that we are having with regard to both facilities being open have nothing to do with the fact that we want to process packages with a conveyor rather than by hand, that we want to fill trucks and have it run 90% full instead of 30% full. It has nothing to do with how we, um, uh, uh, we want to make one trip you know, 300 miles away to pick up no mail versus two trips a day to pick up no mail. And a host of other operational and strategic initiatives that we have in the, in, in, in the plan that enable us to compete with private industry because that's the law that you all have us operating under. To the extent of the other, the, the problems that manifested, this is an organization that has not engaged in change in over 15 years, right? These are, we are taking longstanding broken practices and, and, and a, 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 a less than engaged management style and try and transition from losing $137 billion over the last 15 years to competing with a FedEx or UPS, operate like a FedEx or UPS. The, practice, the, the issues that we had here were, in fact, management issues on the ground, were, in fact, employee attendance issues, were, in fact, basic management tactics that now that the organization is engaged, I am quite confident, I see it. I see the whole team getting better, play, you know, understanding the transition that we have to make, committing more to the transition that we have to make. And I say, sir, we don't have another choice but to carry on. It is a good plan. It's a simple plan, right? We have $20 billion worth of deferred maintenance. That's what we're fixing. Postmaster Job, I just uh, end. And I, I, I understand that change is very hard, especially in a very large organization. It's incredibly uh, difficult. The point that I'm making is that uh, we look at these two facilities with the changes that you've made that have had uh, disruptions and problems. You're not, you said that's going to happen throughout the system in the long term, yet we're not seeing that currently in these others. We're seeing these two particular facilities with these changes are having this kind of, of impact. I'm not against change. You and I have had that discussion before. Our change is good, but if you're starting to see that kind of impact uh, with these changes at these two facilities, is it time just to pause a little bit and say, okay, what, what do we need to tweak? What do we need to change? That's not going to result uh, in this. Uh, I'm not going to bury my head in the sand and say, you got to stay in the status quo. We know that's not working. I understand what you're asking me now. And sir, we have, we have paused, we have changed, we have reorganized, we have committed additional resources. Uh, we are, I have taken my foot on and off the pedal as appropriate to capitalize on the momentum that we have in making the change, the time period that we have before we run out of cash, but recognizing some of the weaknesses that we have in deploying. And I'm very sensitive to that and have stopped many initiatives. There were many more, a few, few more plans supposed to roll out this year, but also within the organization, some of the, some of the, the local things. These plants will succeed. With, with three months, four months into Atlanta, we moved almost 2,000 people from 10 locations around the city into one, right? That, 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 you know, we, we went from processing uh, packages by hand to doing a million a night, right? Uh, uh, Richmond, Richmond, I had a conversation with the OIG last week. She went to Richmond. There's a different attitude within the organization there in terms of learning how to process using in a, in a refurbished plant, using the proper tools, using the proper instruction. That was void. That is part of what we're trying to rebuild here, engagement with our workforce, standard management practices. But we're not doing this blindly with an intent to destroy service. No, I, 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 and I would never imply that, but I would say, so I, I want to just say, I, I heard you say that you are slowing things down. You are taking a look to see uh, as those numbers improve, could we have transparency? As those numbers improve, which you contend will happen with your changes in, in both Richmond and Atlanta, uh, until we see that, uh, you're not you're slowing down the implementation around the country. Is that an accurate? Well, I would not have construction underway. I am mindful of the transition to avoid circumstances like that, and that's how I will deploy myself. Those two plants, Richmond and Atlanta, and the whole Georgia area, will be the, the finest running parts of the organization very shortly. All right, and you know, we have to allow time to transition. Uh, there are consequences. I did not cr create this problem that exists or this trajectory that, that is there, but I'm, 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 we, we have to move out, and we're very, very mindful of, of, of this, and we'll uh, I appreciate put every that. effort to stop that from happening. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, the, the, 
Postal Service uh, recently made another change uh, that's causing issues, and that's the local transportation optimization. Inspector General Hall, you mentioned that uh, in your opening comments, and uh, the change uh, was implemented in Richmond, which the Postmaster General mentioned. But your office uh, published a report yesterday, which you referenced as well, uh, showing it a contributed service declines there. Uh, briefly, because I'm running out of time, does this change have concerns for you, particularly in rural areas, uh, which are uh, tends to be uh, folks that are most vulnerable to uh, these kinds of changes? Yes, we did issue the report yesterday. We found that uh, when the Postal Service implemented this in October, that service declined by 21 percentage points, and the um, majority of the zip codes that were impacted by this local transportation optimization, the vast majority were in rural areas. So we have some concerns. We'll be continuing to look at that, but right now that was the first one that had been implemented, and we saw that the service decline was most uh, most significant in those rural areas. Great. We'll explore that uh, further in the uh, remaining time. Ranking Member Paul, you're recognized for your questions. Mr. Joy, the post office, I guess, before postal reform was losing about a billion dollars a quarter, about four billion dollars a year. It's now it's estimated that, so. to lose, what, uh, maybe 1.5 billion a quarter, or about six billion dollars this year. So, you know, it doesn't sound like a whole lot of success with people talking about, you know, going in the right direction. The question is, is we've known for, I don't know, a decade, two decades, that uh, what the post office sells is diminishing. You know, first class mail, we have, it's a granted monopoly, but it goes down every year, and I think last year it went down 9%. So you've got a declining uh, revenue source, you know, that uh, you make money from. And then you decided to add 125,000 jobs that were part-time jobs and didn't have all of the uh, ramifications of government employment, which are often 50% more expensive than part-time jobs. Why, in a sort of a failing environment of declining sales and uh, perpetual deaths, I mean, just into the future, as, as far as the eye can see, would you want to add more government employees? So uh, first of all, we, the first year I got here, we lost nine and a half billion dollars. The year before that, we lost pretty much about the same. The losses over seven years were over 100, or not, were 90 billion dollars. To your point on, and we've had this discussion, to your point on why convert people, because it wasn't working, sir, in the environment. We were in the middle of a pandemic, right? We had about 60% availability of employees. The management at that particular time treated these people as disposable people. Right? We had significant overtime in, in, in the middle of the pandemic and trying to move forward. And uh, I have a growth plan, and it's growth in the package business. And in fact, we are growing in the, pack, in the package business. But we, we, I've converted 150,000 people to full-time positions because that was the right thing to do in this availability to bring stability to the so organization. So basically adding significant costs uh, in so an era we, we, of perpetual debt. No, because at the end, because of the stability, Right, and because of the attrition rate that we have in the organization, okay, I'm about 20,000 people less than what we had when we came in here. I'm 50 million hours less to do this, to do more business today than when we walked and I walked in the door. Okay, that's operational management principles, sir. Okay, that's an obvious if you're not if you're not in this type of environment. Right, it's something that we had to st stabilize the workforce. We will continue to hire and staff. Uh, uh, right now, in that we have 30,000 less pre-career people, 20,000 more, 20, more full-time people, and the stability of the organization. For the peaks, when I got here, we were hiring 40 and 50,000 people for peak. We hired 8,000 last peak, and we did 133 million more packages than the peak before. And the deficit, the debts continue to mount. I mean, I don't see a whole lot of change. This 10-year projection is rosy on things, but the immediate debts are year on uh, getting worse. Now, sir, we have taken over. So that, that 50, million, 50 million hours is uh, 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 like 4 billion, like uh, uh, over, two, over two, what is it? It's like $5 billion, $5 billion, a couple of billion dollars out of transportation, and we've grown our revenue sig significantly. See, Six point nine billion. So 6 .9 private, corpora billion. private corporations face these kind of problems, and when they do, they don't add to their labor costs. They try to adjust. So if you're in Washington State and you have union labor and it's costing you too much, you expand into South Carolina and you hire non-union labor. It's sort of the same principle with government unions. Your costs are 70, 80 percent is labor. Yeah. You compare yourself to UP, uh, UPS, which is also unionized. They're about 50 percent cost of labor. FedEx, non-unionized, about 38 percent. So 
everybody admits that the labor cost is a big function of the problem, not only in the immediate I, I labor cost, not, not only in the immediate labor cost, but in the pensions, as Mr. Martinez pointed out. But those are labor costs because they're you know you have a bigger labor force, you're going to have bigger pension liabilities. But Mr. Martinez, in the um, private world, you have to account if your pension is short and you're running a private company and you have to make up for the pension with revenue from your company, you count that, right? You, you count that in how your company is doing for the year. Right now, are defined uh, contribution plans. They're not in defined benefit plans, which is what we have here. Okay? So, so you wouldn't add more people. If you were in private business, you wouldn't add more people to an undefined. You'd add them to a defined benefit because you don't want unlimited costs. No, you no, want the defined benefit is when you're obligated to pay a certain amount to the employees. Right. Most private sector companies today are defined contributions. Right. Okay? But so the, the thing is, is they, but by adding $125,000, you are adding to the problem. You are not actually taking uh, away from the problem. By adding permanent employees that will well, be in the same question. sort of plan. That is an operating question. That is that, well, that, not a fact. But it's, it's, part a of the, it's part of the problem. You have a pension problem, right? An underfunding of the pension, and you have we to We have a problem for created it. by government. Yeah. On you us. have an underfunded pension, and you, so you have to account for it, but you are adding more people onto that traditional pension. So we have a pension problem in Kentucky, and it is the same kind of thing. It's the defined benefit versus a defined contribution. Most people get what they put in. They don't just sort of get an amount on and on and on. You get what you put in based on the contribution. But you are not changing that model. You're adding more people to that well, model. The, the, the pension model was thrust on us. I know, but it, you're, adding, us you're adding 125,000 new people to the pension model. So you that's complain a about question. the pension that's model, that's but you're adding employees to it. So I don't think you're making your situation any better, and it's not what a private corporation would do. Well, a the private other, corporation the other, is not obligated to be in every single delivery point um, in, the, in the United States. And, and most private corporations uh, and that, don't and that, have a monopoly either. So you know, goes, there, there is oh, that as well. A monopoly so, that is declining. But, but here's my point. When you get to the pensions being a problem and you say most of this is generated by pensions and past pensions and this was all thrust upon you, that's fine, but you're adding people to that problem. So when you add 125,000 people to it, you are making your problem worse, not better, in the long run. So in our state, what we do is we're hiring people with a different pension plan. They, 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 they give to a, a 401k and they're going to get what they put into it. Exactly. And that, that's how you convert. But that's what you should be doing. You should be trying right. to get everybody, you should not hire any new employees. But Every year you should get smaller and you should put people into a different type of a pension We can program. have a discussion about that, but we need legislation for that then. Well, no, you don't need legislation to for privately the contract. You don't need, you, you had this. We, you, you're converting cannot, from the one thing that actually works at the post office, and that is privately contracting people who are not in the government union. It's the only way under today's rules. I would change the rules. Yes, I would change the rules. I would try to fix your pension. But your other point is, is that the pension causes so many of these costs, but when you actually look at the pension, you say, well, we have to buy only treasuries. Probably the last year has been the best year for treasuries in the in the past ten oh, you're, years. You're, I'm sorry, because I interest rate, I because interest disagree because with of that. interest rates have risen. This I, is that you have been in a negative interest environment. Do you, you know how? Uh, have, do you know how the treasury? You, you also have interest rates rising. You know it's how, better than any other year you've had. Do you know how the treasury invests our pension assets? Do you know? I, I respectfully can't, ask can't, you the question. I can't not, answer the question. I can't. Okay, I'll I, tell I can't you. Hear you. We turn over the money. And they basically put it in a ladder portfolio of 15 years. So we're locked into a rate. The OIG report, and you might be able, you might be able to correct me, I think our average return in 2022 was like 3.4% or something in that area. Right. Uh, that's probably better than it was five years ago. Would be 3.4 percent when inflation is okay. running at 8 percent. No, I'm not it's saying a, it's, it's great. A loser. It's, it's still a terrible <laughs> investment. Nothing makes sense about the pension program. I'm not there to defend okay. your well, pension so program. What's your question? I'm against your pension program, but I'm against putting more people in it. So you don't quite get it. You want to quibble over Senator, the pension the, the program getting this, Senator. but you're adding more people to it. You need to add less people to it, and you need to convert your labor force. It's the only way you can survive. Otherwise, we just keep doling out more massive subsidies to you. Senator, we have, we have not added 125,000 people. We have less people in our employee than we did before. We have we attrit 40,000 people a Your year. Your DFA says it. you want to add 150,000, and you but have you, added over $100,000 to the that government that's union. Not, that's, not, that, that's not my plan. And we've, we've used 50 million less work hours, 50 million less work hours this year to do, to do the job. Long range, we will right-size our workforce for the work that we have to do. Right? And that is what part of the plan is. 
Senator Johnson, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll start with the, Mr. Martinez, because we're talking about pensions and investments. Uh, when you hold a U.S. Treasury and it's a low interest rate and the interest goes up, the value of that bond goes down, correct? Goes down. Do you have to recognize that on your income statement? Or because well, you hold these things in maturity, do you not recognize that loss? We'll do indirectly in that the OPM, and not us, not our, our auditors, calculate actuarially what our amortization of unfunded pensions are. To the extent that our value goes down, then that cost goes up, theoretically. But I don't know. They tell us what it is that we have to put in. So, yeah, I, I, I'd be surprised if you had to downvalue that because you're holding it to maturity. You're just, you're just getting hit by the fact that you're earning a very low rate of return versus what's available in the marketplace. By, by the way, the, the comment you made in terms of uh, the $800 billion of lost opportunity, had you invested that in just a normal type of uh, balanced fund, would have also been true from, for Social Security had we not spent that money and invested that in. I know they didn't exist at the time, but uh, you know, some kind of uh, you know, ETF or some, some kind of uh, Dow Jones Index Fund, we'd have 7 or $8 trillion in real assets, but we didn't do that. We spent the money, it's gone. But that's, if we had been able to invest point. like Amtrak or TVA on a diversified portfolio, that surplus would have been money that we would, wouldn't have had to put into the pension fund but rather spend on our capital investments. So, so this gets me to my next point, and it's the constraints that uh, the Postmaster General talked about. You're ba basically you're operating and uh, reporting to a 400 or 535 member board of directors here that impose on you certain business conditions that you would not uh, recognize, or you wouldn't operate that way if you're in the private sector, right, Mr. Post Postmaster General? <laughs> well, we have laws that we need to follow and have different impacts on us used to protect the monopoly that no longer exists. Right. So the, qu the question I have is, what are those major constraints? Now, let's get them on the table. What, what, are you, what does Congress force you to do that in any kind of rational private sector business you wouldn't do because you keep losing your you-know-what? Yeah. Well, I, I think the, 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 first, the first part was the, was the, was the pre-funding legislation that we worked together to get passed uh, 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 last year. Um, no, I no, think you, you did get infusion. I, I never would have thought this would happen. I was chairman. A hundred billion dollars plus uh, well, to offload th part that's of That's a perspective correct? that no I don't share, right? It was a non-cash adjustment to the balance sheet. Let me finish. Huh? Sorry. <laughs> The, the, you you relieved uh, the liability. That was legislation. How, by the way, how, how much of the liability were you relieved of? I'm not up to speed on those numbers. I mean, your, your total unfunded liability pension was over $200 well, we, billion, we, we, we still have the same obligations long term to pay for our retirement Without having to recognize debt. it. It's just the pre-funding le legislation that was passed in 2006, probably the dagger in the heart of the Postal Service between what it did, what, what it did with regard to the pre-funding and also the, uh, 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 the price-fixing that, that it instituted, that the PRC oversaw, right, that uh, uh, through basic division you would have seen that. I mean, you were seeing it every year, yeah. $10 billion losses. Yeah, we, billion we, we talked about that. Again, okay. that, was an, that was an insane bill that was passed, what, okay, 2006? there's a whole bunch that, of insane things that, and, that you know, have yeah, the consequences again, today. That's, that the, that's to, the 535-member genius board yeah. that uh, I appreciate the to. legislation that you passed. Right, that gave us room to move move forward. I I I, I would have liked to have seen CSRS get it signed off. It didn't. I'm moving forward in operational and financial, uh, you know, financial uh, revenue producing I issues. I think the regulate. I think the piece of the Postal Service Regulatory Commission needs to be looked at, right, in terms of what their impact and effect. I have I have a I have a board, Senate appointed uh, board, a Senate appointed commission. Um, um, these are, uh, I, I think they're, uh, that this organization is not set up to deal with what this Congress is asking us to do, which is compete in the market. We have $39 billion worth of mail. It costs us $65 billion to deliver it. The only way to make that up is by driving costs out, potentially which, which, which you're not allowed to do in many well, cases. I mean, right? I mean you're, constra and, you're constraining and, what you can do in and terms grow of cost in the package measures. And grow in the package market, which we are. And we're driving costs out too. I am an op I am hopeful. Uh, we've had these short-term uh, these short-term issues, but the the when go to some of these operations, go look at the difference in the Atlanta in Atlanta. Go look at the overall strategy. No strategy existed. This was a randomly deployed haphazard organization that had no mission. 
There's a purpose within the organization now. People are engaged in terms of trying to make this, this work, and the strategy is not that s complex. It's simple. Load your trucks. So, so again, what, what Congress does what always does. I mean, they, they'll they throw more money at the problem. Uh, not, my guess, when you get a few ten, tens of billions of dollars thrown at you, you can use it to some effective uh, Impact. Uh, I, I'm not, I, listen, I have not, I've asked for, that's what I have asked for. I think we have an operational path forward to solve a lot of this problem. If, if you know, we, it's not without consequence as we do it, uh, but uh, I, I'm pretty, uh, 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 you know, positive about what the, what the, what the, everybody's engaged in, in the organization, including our leading, our union leadership. So again, what, what, what I would try and listen to can't really do it in seven minutes, but if you could do it offline, I mean, I would really like to fully understand what those constraints are, and if you really could change the law. Again, I say without affecting service, you're going to affect service. You, you can't continue to do what we keep doing in a declining market environment. But anyway, I, I'd like to, to hear from that. I do have one other question submitted by one of my constituents who actually produced the blue boxes. Apparently, you're going to... Uh, higher security blue boxes, and they're just asking, are you going to be issuing, I guess, the specs on those, some kind of strategic plan, so they can plan on it, so they can deliver those blue boxes to you as a cost-effective manner as possible? Uh, I, I think we have purchased about 25,000 uh, high security boxes, and I, we have a deployment plan, so if you, you want, I could... Uh, uh, get with the uh, uh, retail and delivery group and the inspection service. Okay, yeah, if you, if you could you know. You know, get us in contact with somebody just on the basis not of Not somebody this. wants to break into them, does it? Pardon? It's not somebody who wants to break into them, is it? I, <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, I think this is a cooperative uh, type of uh, question. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hassan, recognized for your questions. Well, thanks, Chair Peters, and thanks to you and Ranking Member Paul for holding this hearing. Uh, which is particularly timely for New Hampshire because of the Postal Service's plans to move operations from the Manchester Processing and Distribution Center to Boston over the next year. Granite Staters reach out to my office daily about delivery issues that they are experiencing. This new plan from the Postal Service could exacerbate this, these issues by leading to more delayed mail deliveries, delayed absentee ballots, and job losses for postal employees, and that is unacceptable. Two years ago, we passed the Bipartisan Postal Service Reform Act to help the Postal Service achieve financial stability. In addition, Senator Collins and I worked together to help secure $10 billion in relief funds for the Postal Service during the pandemic. Congress took action to allow the Postal Service to achieve its core mission to deliver mail to every customer at least six days per week, but the Postal Service's current plan fundamentally lacks a commitment to service. Granite Staters and all Americans deserve a new plan for reliable, timely postal delivery. And this is true whether they live in rural or urban areas, whether they are waiting for a customer's check to come in, whether they're a grandparent waiting for a birthday card from their grandchild, or whether they are waiting for life-saving medications. So let me start with a question to you, Inspector General Hull. A few years ago, the Postal Service hired an additional 150 postal workers in New Hampshire based on an Inspector General report that I requested. I appreciate your partnership on that report and the work of your office. However, as I noted, service issues persist in New Hampshire. I'm particularly concerned that moving critical operations from Manchester to Boston will result in significant delivery delays. I'm also concerned that postal employees will face an impossible choice between commuting to Boston, and for those of you who don't know, this is ranked as one of the worst commutes in the country. You're talking about two hours each way for some of these employees at least uh, to be reliably on time at work. It's one of the worst commutes in the country, and so they're going to face this choice to keep their jobs or leave the Postal Service altogether. So based on your observations, Inspector General, from previous consolidations, what can Granite Staters expect when operations move from Manchester to Boston, specifically what delays might customers see, and what will postal employees experience? Yeah, thank you, Senator Haston, and I appreciate the opportunity to work with your staff on pre previous um, opportunities. I, I can't speak to specifics on what will happen directly in New Hampshire, but I can tell you what we've seen 
uh, so far. In Richmond, we, we've seen challenges, particularly in service performance and in there's a, there was a real need for a better pre-implementation kind of ground game to get the employees on board so that they can understand exactly what the changes involve and how to get them engaged in supporting the change and working through what those service changes are going to entail. As far as employees go, um, I don't know how many, I know, I know a little bit about what that uh, facility will be moved from and to, but I don't know how many of those employees will be retained at that local facility and, that, and how many of them will actually have to make decisions that you spoke of on, on where to go. But, but I think if the Postal Service can, can address some of the recommendations that we made in Richmond, we're in Atlanta right now, we'll make some similar recommendations on what, what the challenges are and if they can take these lessons learned and really uh, focus on those to really uh, before they actually implement the change instead of after and trying to recover from the service disruptions that, that have occurred. Well, I appreciate that. I would also suggest that this is not necessarily about getting employees on board. It's about listening to employees. They are the experts in delivering mail. They are the experts in their states. They're the experts. They're the ones who know um, where a particular address is when somebody writes the wrong address on an envelope. But they are the people who know this area, and you might all start with listening to them about what they think the impacts will be on service, service being the paramount obligation here. Uh, to Chairman uh, Kubeyondu, Northern New Hampshire postal customers aren't served by the Manchester facility. They're served in White River Junction, Vermont. Under the Postal Service's plans, operations at the White River Junction facility also could be, could be consolidated. So now we've got Manchester going to Boston under your plan. And here's the plan for White River Junction. It's going to Hartford, Connecticut, 150 miles away. So now we're taking two of the northern New England states in the northern part of those states and just taking out any of these processing centers. Um, for Granite Staters in the North Country in particular, the Postal Service is a lifeline. We're still working on getting high-speed internet to them. Uh, the roads are not optimal. Um, and cell service often isn't great. So the Postal Service remains particularly important up there, especially when you're talking about the delivery of medication and essential goods. It also connects people, and it is also a critical resource for local businesses who rely on the Postal Service because, um, no surprise, FedEx and UPS won't deliver up there. So the Postal Service is all we've got. So the Postal Regulatory Commission has the authority to ensure that the Postal Service meets its service obligations. How could the Postal Regulatory Commission use its authority to ensure that the Postal Service meets its service obligations, especially in rural areas like New Hampshire's North Country? Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, the, I, I will say that the, the portion of the law that requires the Postal Service to consult with the Commission uh, as it's implementing service standards is not one that has uh, a lot of teeth. It's a requirement to consult. Um, however, the Postal Service has the direct authority over uh, its own operational and service strategies. If you, as you've seen, um, they're quite aggressive in terms of exercising their autonomy. However, there are things that the Postal Regulatory Commission can do. Um, the, the part of the law that has a little bit more teeth is the advisory opinion process in which the commission um, issues an advisory opinion uh, to the Postal Service. It's, uh, these are on the record uh, proceedings where uh, stakeholders can come in and lay out some of those issues um, that you've, you've pointed to that will affect um, stakeholders um, and then the, the commission is able to uh, d do a deeper dive, um, take into account all those uh, different positions and um, issue recommendations. Uh, you pointed to medications. Uh, during 2021 and 2022, um, the commission issued four advisory opinions. We repeatedly pointed out these issues. I have to commend our staff. Our, our tiny staff did a tremendous job, and they identified all of the issues um, that we've seen, uh, the, the issues with medications, lack of communication with stakeholders, uh, frankly, over-optimistic forecasts. Yep. Um, and um, so I think that that advisory opinion um, process uh, does have some teeth, and a new advice your opinion might be warranted as you see this ramp up of uh, delivering for America. 
Um, we also have direct authority uh, to approve the service measurement system. I think that's a concern, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, that we might be actually underestimating the, the delays in many cases. The, um, you hear uh, you know, the stories and also see the statistics um, heading in the wrong uh, direction. Uh, that's something we, we're uh, actually very interested in taking a look at. Um, and I'll also say uh, we recently opened up a, a docket to reconsider the uh, the rate making system, and one of the reasons we cited was uh, service performance. That is one of the uh, factors that's in the law as we're uh, conducting um, this proceeding. I appreciate that, and thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Um, again, this is about service. The Postal Service was established by our founders and is protected in the United States Constitution because it is not just any private business. It has an obligation of service that is essential to our people and to our economy. Thank you. Senator Marshall, I recognize for your questions. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said in list of y'all's testimonies, I'm just reminded that no good deed goes unpunished. And I don't doubt the sincerity of you and your employees wanting to deliver a good product at an affordable price for uh, the American taxpayers. I, I want to start off with something very positive to report. As you all know, there's a fentanyl explosion going on across this country. And we're losing uh, 300 Americans every day to fentanyl poisoning. We've lost 250,000 Americans to fentanyl poisoning. And now, um, criminals are using the United States Postal Service and other private carriers to send those fentanyl tablets uh, to different locations, including in Kansas. I'm proud to report that your cooperation, the U.S. Postal Service's cooperation with the Kansas Bureau of Investigation and their canines, they've uh, been able to capture 66,000 fentanyl pills. Uh, I sure hope the other uh, public entities as, as well as the private entities are all cooperating with this effort as well to, to uh, stop this horrible, horrible epidemic. Um, my first question or comment would be to the Postmaster General. The city of Olathe is perhaps the fastest growing city in Kansas. It has a thriving downtown. Unfortunately, there's a railroad right through the middle of downtown and a very busy postal office there as well. The city would like to move that postal, post office somewhere else, uh, outside of town probably. And they're willing to throw some money at it as well. And so far they've met resistance from that. Mr. I'm sure this is a blip on your screen, Mr. Postmaster General, but are you aware of the situation in Olathe? No, I'm not. But would I'm you, aware of other requests like this from other places. Well, we would sure appreciate uh, your office taking a little closer look at it. Again, you have a city that's willing to cooperate, help pay for part of the situation. Uh, I think your operations would be more uh, efficient if your uh, drivers weren't coming in and out of that traffic jam as well. Yeah, I'll take a look into it, sir. Thank you. Um, the next question is going to be directed towards the Inspector General Hall as, as well. Uh, as, as you may know, the, the services in the Kansas City metro area are of great concern as well. Uh, what I understand is maybe a third of the mail is late, taking over three days. I, I believe that's your report as well. Are you familiar with that report in Kansas City, and what were your conclusions concisely? Yes. Um, what we saw in the Kansas, Missouri area, and we did some work, I think it's been about probably seven or eight months ago now, but we a lot of the problems were related to staffing and an inability to retain staff for all, uh, in the delivery units primarily. And so as a result, some of the routes weren't being delivered every day because they just were uh, understaffed uh, in, in some of those locations. And some of it is due to the inability to hire quickly and also the, uh, the challenges in the labor force where uh, uh, wages have increased maybe in some places faster than the Postal Service wages. Okay. I'm going to go through some numbers here, and I wish I could give them to you. You may want to write them down. But in, in 2001, the Postal Service employed 775,000 people and were delivering 103 billion first-class mail a year. 775,000 people, 103 billion first-class pieces of mail. In 2013, your numbers bottomed out for employees of 491,000 and 65 billion first class mail were delivered. And, and then in 2023, 525,000. So increased numbers from, from the decade before. 525,000 employees and 45 billion pieces of mail. 
So I know you saw so your point here that they're having a problem in a particular area hiring folks, mm -hmm. uh, but yet the number of people employed by the post office are going up. The volume is, is less than half of what it was before. And I certainly understand the economic ramifications, but can you put the, connect those two pieces sure, in yeah, any way, it's, shape, or form? It, it, it looks like a disconnect, right? And I think the challenge is that the Postal Service is everywhere. They're in every neighborhood every day. And so you may see big, broad, nationwide numbers that, that look like like one scenario, but when you go... When you, and that's one of the reasons that we do a lot of really focused local work because every city, every location in America kind of has its own story. And so what we saw, the, the nationwide numbers are exactly what, what you gave, but in Kansas City specifically, they they had real, real challenges in hiring in that location. So, so sometimes you see... Um, you know, areas that are not having problems, uh, we're not having, Postal Service not having problems filling positions, but in other places, it's it's been a real challenge. So Postmaster General, if we could follow up on that. In the, in the private sector, I would assume that they would move some employees to there. They would figure out a way to, to make sure that that customer service is continued. What ties your hands from, or, or what's your assessment of the situation? So two things. In 2001, with 775,000 people, we had, we didn't have packages. <laughs> Okay. Today, we have a whole bunch of packages that we're moving around the nation, right? Uh, uh, with regard to rural areas on delivery, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. An, an age-old uh, uh, labor position called the Rural Carrier Associate uh, is probably one of the most ill-defined, worst jobs in the nation. It's, a, it's uh, the way we staff uh, 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 according to different rules that you have to work, everybody's off day, and so on and so forth. So we've been making aggressive efforts to try and change that process, use the formula method that enables us to rebalance people. And, and we've with, done a lot of work in that. But rural, well, with, with all due respect, I'm not sure I would call Kansas City Metro a rule. Well, rural carries with regard to what our definition of rural is. So Kansas City state. is considered a this rural? This could be areas out in the Kansas City area that would be a rural a rural. Okay, la state. last question to the uh, Postmaster General. Is there a disconnect between your all's leadership positions and the execution of your plans? Do you feel a significant resistance from, uh, from, so, the, uh, non, from the political appointees or the non-political appointees? No. Why, why are no, we struggling so I, I think there's just an, there's a disconnect from me and the organization when I walked in, right? Because I'm bringing, trying to bring in commercial practices as required by law to, co to deliver mail and packages in an innovative manner and cover our cost. Right, and we had no effort, no practice that did that. We had a random, haphazard, unmanaged system. It took a long time to get this, the manager, I've reorganized probably 13 times uh, since I've, I've been there in, in, in different types of positions to find a balance. And I have a, a leadership team that's very much engaging. And now we're bringing it out into the field. And we have made significant gains. We delivered, mail, we delivered the COVID test kits to 165 million addresses across the country within, within two days right in time of crisis. Uh, we've made significant gains. As we engage in this change, it is plant by plant, person by person, driver by driver that has to take on a new way of working, a new way of thinking, okay? And it's easy to criticize when you show up at the, at the crime scene and see the damage, okay? But the path there is, is long and his people are working very hard to change Heinz and Marx in terms of how we, how we perform. And, and they are, in fact, doing that. I'm, I'm well qualified to recognize an organization that is changing how it, how it, how it executes, uh, okay, versus the way we were stagnant and, and letting things just uh, 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 happen to us. So that's why I'm optimistic about the changes. It may, it's probably to no one's satisfaction in this room or in this town, but it's what we got. This is the plan we're going with. We're moving forward, and it is, in fact, having an impact and it will make the Postal Service better. Senator Rosen, recognized for your questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman Peters. And uh, uh, I'm going to quote you, um, I.G. Hull. Every location has a story. You just said that. So I'm going to talk about the story of Reno, Nevada, northern Nevada, Mr. DeJoy. I'm extremely concerned about your proposal to downsize the only postal processing and distribution center in northern Nevada, one of only two in my entire state. Your proposed plan includes transferring mail processing operations from Reno out of state to California, which will negatively impact mail delivery service for Nevadans. Under your proposal, 
If one of my constituents in Reno were to mail a birthday card to her mother who lives on the other side of town, the letter is going to be driven 130 miles over to Sacramento, California, and then sent 130 miles back to Nevada to reach its final destination. And so I'd like to understand what analysis you undertook to conclude that moving mail processing from Reno to Sacramento would actually benefit Nevadans. Your staff has continued to assert that your plan won't undermine delivery standards for Nevada, but they haven't been able to explain how this is possible or provide me any of the data you've collected. And per what you just said, your team, they came and met with us, but they have not engaged with stakeholders in Nevada. I've talked to every one of our city councils. They have yet to receive data, and Senator Cortez Masto, myself, and Congressman Amadate didn't receive it either. So I'd like to ask you a few yes or no questions, please, because my time is limited. Mr. DeJoy, the Postal Service standard for receiving and delivering mail in the Reno area is two days. The Postal Service is already failing to meet the standard with outbound mail and service in Reno currently averaging about four days. I point this out because in order to take local mail from Reno to Sacramento and back to Reno as you propose, your trucks will need to go through the Donner Pass. I hope you're familiar with that. It's on I-80. It's the only way to get through Reno to Sacramento, which is subject to some of the most extreme weather conditions in the contiguous United States, with over 33 feet of snow annually, 100 mile per hour winds, and treacherous conditions during wildfire season. So Mr. DeJoy, yes or no, do you happen to know how many days per year, on average, the Donner Pass is closed due to extreme weather conditions? Why would I know that? Well, you're the Postmaster General, and you're saying that you're going to go over this. So let me tell you, there were 15 road closures for over 37 days of closures just last winter alone. So yes or no, before you proposed your plan to move out of Reno, did you collect data on the potential impact to mail service from severe weather conditions on Donner Pass? Yes or no, please. Yes, within the organization. We so have can I have that data? Your team has refused to set, give that to us. We are the oversight committee. I believe that the United States Congress has a right to this information. I will give you the data that we have. I'll get with the team and Thank send you, you the data we have. So how do you plan to get the mail? Maybe you want to uh, tell us how you plan to get the mail from Reno to Sacramento and back to Reno when there's only one route. I say one route, I-80, to take that 260-mile round trip when it's closed on an average of 37 days per year. Let, me, let me start with the fact that the, we're not we're investing significantly in the Reno facility to repurpose it for what we, what we feel is the modern day need for, for postal service. The mail that we're moving, only 10% of it. We're only moving so you want to sacrifice 10% of my folks in rural Nevada. I've got, sacrifice it. I have rural Nevadans, veterans and seniors that still rely on this. That 10%. If it's your in the 10%, it's everything. So a standard contingency plan here, Mr. DeJoy, is not going to work. The extreme conditions in Sierra Nevada mountains require you to undertake an extensive analysis to ensure all Nevadans, all Nevadans, even that 10%, get their mail on time. You don't get to sacrifice those living in my rural areas or subject to harsher weather in the name of cost savings. The Postal Service has an obligation to deliver to everyone. Um, let me ask you this. Before developing this plan to downsize the Reno facility and transfer operations to California, did you analyze how your plan, proposed plan would impact Nevada seniors? And can you provide me that data here today? Yes or no, please. We have a process to analyze the movement of mail and- Have you done one that would impact my Nevada seniors? Look at that. We, look, we, we treat every, every delivery point the same. Do you have one for Nevada seniors? So you didn't look at how it would impact my seniors. That's unacceptable. I, if you did, I expect to see that data as soon as possible, and hopefully by the close of business today, please. I believe that um, I have to assume the reason I don't have the data is because you instructed your staff not to provide it to me when we requested I think it last that's month. That's very inaccurate and presumptuous. It wasn't provided to me when I asked for it last month, and it wasn't I'm provided when we that, asked for but it last week. I didn't week. direct my staff to do anything with regard. Fair In enough. Fact, you've been briefed many times. So, and your staff what about the impact time. of your plan on Nevada's veterans? We have over 225,000 veterans in Nevada. Yes or no? Did the you collect data have, on the impact in Nevada delivered, veterans? Mail delivered. Wherever their veterans live, this should have no impact. We're not. So, we're will not you saying, provide me that data? 
Will you provide me the data? I, because I if provide, you didn't we have provide, it, provide our uh, plan as to how so the you mail didn't will be transported specifically see how it would impact Nevada veterans. That's actually unacceptable to me as well. I've again asked this for in, this information over a, a month ago. Point in Nevada. Okay, Nevada. Not, it's if, Nevada, sir. Please say it correctly. It's Nevada. If a veteran lives, lives at a delivery point, we would. We're, we're, our intention is to give him the mail in in, in a timely service that we. You're have not giving him in the timely service now. So what makes you that, think it's going to go in four days? I hope to see the data by the end of the day, please. Uh, Mr. DeJoy, an Inspector General audit showed that the Postal Service uh, implemented the same changes to a data proce to processing and distribution center in Virginia. And service performance was not even included as a measure of success. So this time around, did you conduct any analysis on how your proposed changes would impact mail delivery service, time specifically in Northern Nevada? Yes or no, please. Those are two separate operations and separate types of transactions. So I'm assuming Richmond. it's no. So you didn't feel that you had a due diligence to understand how Nevada senior citizens, veterans, small business owners, and rural communities who depend on the post office for their lives and livelihoods. Senator, um, we intend to meet the service standards. You're not right. meeting it now, and you've refused. Okay, you have to not provide the us standards. the data of what you've made this assessment on. Um, I hope to see that as quickly as possible, and I'd like to move on to the next question. Um, well, actually, I have 10 seconds. I will yield, and we'll wait for the second round. Thank you. Senator Langford, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you. Thank you all. It's incredibly complicated. There's a lot that's going on. And uh, I had a conversation with someone sitting at a table last week uh, that complained to me about where are we at 67 cents at this point uh, for a first-class stamp. And um, they complained to me about the cost of that. And I said, I tell you what, I'm going to hand you a letter, and I'm going to hand you 67 cents, and I'd like for you just to take this to somebody in Anchorage, Alaska for me. And uh, they just smiled and said, point given. So the complications of this is immense. Uh, I'm also amazed as I have listened to other parts of the dais today uh, about um, a $4 billion loss for the post office possibly, or maybe up to six, realizing that today this Congress overspent four billion dollars that's our current rate of burn a day right now uh, so it's always interesting to me when we in congress start criticizing any entity for overspending and where things are going uh, because we have our own challenges on that so saying all that this is complicated i get that what i'm always grateful for are specific solutions mr martinez you brought a set of specific solutions to us on how to be able to handle debt and investing quite frankly if the post office was allowed to be able to invest the same way just for federal and retirees are able to invest this would be very different but the post office has a very different standard than what federal retiree benefits actually have on it for the investment those are specific solutions i appreciate that i do have a couple of things just to be able to bring up though because as we walk through all of these different issues, I'm trying to identify when this gets better. We've talked about Richmond, we've talked about Atlanta and the decline in the service turnaround. We've talked about the increased cost on it. For the service turnaround time period, Mr. Joy, I know you've said over and over again, give us a little bit more time, the service will get better on it. What do you anticipate? Just take Atlanta for an example, because I've got Tulsa and Oklahoma City, there's Fayetteville, there's others that impact Oklahoma. They're about to walk through this process. Is it an expectation that every one of these locations will see a decline and then it will increase as far as the delivery time period? Uh, uh, I expect Atlanta, Richmond, uh, to we we've opened up other RPDCs and they've been they have not been as con as consequential. I expect these 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 operations to be stabilized coming into the summer. You know, in, into the summertime, there are other aspects of things that we're doing that impact this transportation initiatives to to uh, stop running empty trucks. Fifty thousand empty trucks around the country. Uh, and, and so forth. So there are a lot of things coming together uh, that will prove out this model is in fact, it will in fact, it will in fact work. Uh, with regard to, so that's what, what, what I think combined with coming up on the election, I expect that we will, we will slow down on a lot of the uh, uh, moves, continue with the, with the construction site. These MPAs that we're talking about, Reno, Tulsa, which are all will get investments into them to more, more appropriately serve the community and package industry and uh, a package business and so forth. 
uh, uh, will most likely, we're collecting all the data to put our project plan to roll out these transitions around 40 locations, and most likely will not happen until the end of the first year. Nobody's gonna have to commute to Boston. Nobody's gonna have to commute to, to uh, 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 I forget where we're going in. Uh, in Oklahoma in, City, Oklahoma, yeah. Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, we, uh, and we're putting money into these facilities that have significant deferred, uh, you know, deferred, uh, 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 you know, deferred maintenance. So g give me a little more specifics on the timeline, because you're saying because of the election, there's going to be a pause to be able to make sure we well, get through all the election these are delivery. 40, these are 40 sites. They're smaller mail moves. We've done this in the past. This is separate than the rollout of the network in Atlanta and so forth. This is just picking up outgoing mail moving it to a place where we can consolidate all the outgoing mail that goes around the country and refurbishing the facilities and make them more, appro you know, make them more appropriate for today's, for today's business that we're going to be doing. So these are smaller moves. We don't expect to move people. Atlanta was moving, at, 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 you know, like I said, 1,500 people out of 10 plants. So timeline. When you said you're pausing this, the changes based on the We're going to collect all the stuff. We'll put a project plan together for all these sites, and most likely the, the, any of the mail move work will start after the first of, uh, uh, you know, uh, after the first of the year. Uh, the construction might start earlier on, the, on these locations. So I've heard that uh, there's no change in uh, FTEs except by attrition in some of these locations yeah. in that. Yeah. There's tell, no me, change. tell me how that works. Yeah. So um, as I said, we attrit 40,000 people uh, a, a year. We stop the hiring and, and, and the work, workforce comes down. I expect in these locations, I expect our package business to grow. Uh, uh, I'm not, we're not asking anybody to move. This is the way the format is put together. Uh, but I expect that we will attrit our labor down to the level that we need if it goes down. But I'm also expecting new demands and services that will, in fact, in fact, grow. We have a higher turnover rate on our pre-career. Uh, but we're not going to chase people out, out of these, uh, out of these the, facilities. The percentage in these locations that are experiencing change of supervisory to non-supervisory employees, will that percentage change? Say that again, sir. The, the percentage of change, the ratio of supervisory employees and non-supervisory employees in these changes, will there be a difference in the ratio there? No, I think those ra those ratios stay pretty. Uh, they're pretty memorialized in terms of how we operate. Other than for vacancies or inability to to uh, uh, to hire, we try and staff to a, a complement profile, and we'll continue to do that. So, I, so, I, these are not bad things. Right. So, so the, Senator, Senator Paul brought up the issue about insourcing, and I know there's been some areas for the part-time moving to full-time, understand that based on the career changes on this. On the transportation side, there has been a move towards insourcing on transportation. What's the cost benefit on that uh, for not having outsourcing for some of the transportation areas? I think that, that the, the, the consequence of that is very exaggerated. We run 55,000 trucks a day right. on, a, on a contracted side. We've made significant changes on the, uh, in, in terms of our supplier profile. We were having people go out of business every quarter, strand, you know, that we're moving 5,000, 10,000 trucks you know, around the country. That is changing the profile there on the local on the local trips, servicing from processing plants to the new sorting and delivery centers in S and DCs. We are, we, we are converting to a, a new driver type, PVO, non-CDL driver, right? So we can, we can train within our own workforce and putting them in you know, straight trucks, smaller vehicles to more appropriately shuttle within the community uh, 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 to, uh, to serve both the mail and package, uh, you know, package business. This is a common practice. Uh, 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 and I think it, 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 in the end of the day, it will be uh, you know, more, more It'll be more reliable. It'll be just as cost, you know, cost effective, and it's the right thing to do with all the transition that we're doing within some of my my uh, 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 you know work complement. Right? We're taking. We, we added 500 conveyors. That gets productivity out. We don't need as many hands. Right? We need. I need positives also, and this is a function. And I don't think I, I've look, I've come out of out of industry. I've looked at our wage rates. I've looked at including the, 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 the benefits. I know where labor is. I knew where labor was going before I got here. I was in that business, right? So I think that it's, I, I think that the, the, the postal employee can be successful here. The service can be successful here. We just have to change just about everything we're doing, okay, which is what we're embarking on. But I think it will be, uh, 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 you know, more reliable in terms of our service and flexibility. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, recognized for your questions. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. 
Mr. DeJoy, I want to focus on a number of local situations in Connecticut where the Postal Service uh, controls property and where it could be more responsive, in fact, has been either non-responsive to me or insufficiently responsive to me and members of our delegation. First, in the town of Ridgefield, there is uh, a specific piece of land behind the United States Postal Service facility. The town wants to use it for overflow parking in the downtown area. Small businesses are struggling to find parking spaces. That lot is empty at every hour of the day. Never seen a car in the lot. Uh, we've sent letters, Representative Himes and I, to the Postal Service, uh, which has been non-responsive to date. Are you familiar with these requests that we made? No. Um, I would, would you respond personally? Yeah, I'll get. I was I was just in Connecticut, uh, and make available week. this land to local I don't local know. I have business. to look at. I have to look at. I'm not going to give it. I'll, I'll look at it and I'll get back to you. Okay. If I can't do it, I'll let you Second, know. Second, in the town of Litchfield, again, uh, part of a post office parking lot is sought by the town for a temporary construction easement in connection with a, the development of the old courthouse into a new facility. I gather by the look on your face that you're not familiar with the Litchfield I'm Postal not, no, property. I'm not, I'm not. Again, would you certainly respond to me? Mm -hmm. Because uh, so far, there has been inadequate response from the Postal Service. In Milford, the town is redeveloping its downtown as Part of that effort, they want to move the post office location and also redevelop the property. So far, the uh, Postal Service has failed to respond to the town or to the developer of the property. And in fact, there is a meeting today of the delegation to discuss the next steps. I know you may not be responsive, you may not be familiar with the details, but if you could respond to me personally about the Milford situation, Litchfield and Ridgefield, and finally in Norwalk. Again, the business community, which is vital to local development and jobs and economic progress, is creating a large plaza next to the United States Postal Service facility as part of the redevelopment of South Norwalk. The city would like to acquire a portion of that land to create a connection to commercial garage, in return provide the Postal Service with land to create a customer parking lot, which the facility certainly lacks, very much in your interest, the town's interest, the business community's interest. Postal Service has been radio silent, mm -hmm. non-responsive. Would you look into that situation in Norwalk I'll, I'll and get into, back to me? Yep, I'll look into them all and I'll get back to you. Um, I want to turn to uh, mail theft and assaults on letter carriers. Growing problem in our country in recent years. Last fall, the Postal Service's Office of Inspector General released a report highlighting these very troubling trends noting that carrier robberies and mail theft are on the rise across the country. In Connecticut, I've heard from postal employees, lots of them, about the serious impacts of assaults, robbery. They're increasingly vulnerable. These attacks have far-reaching effects. I don't need to tell you hardworking civil servants are afraid to do their jobs. And Americans' confidence in our, rail system, our mail system is undermined. And so I think there has to be action in response. I'm supporting a measure called the Postal Police Reform Act of 2023. It's led by Senators Durbin and Collins, bipartisan. It's a common sense bipartisan bill that simply clarifies an authority for postal police officers that 
can help address the threat of violence, assault, and robbery. I'd like to ask you and the Inspector General for your support of this measure, the police, Postal Police Reform Act. Yeah, I, I would have to. I would say that we have done a lot over the last year with regard to stepping up activities around the country on postal crime. Um, uh, I have 600 postal uh, police officers in the country. That's hardly enough to do, have any impact on the 260,000 routes and 300 carriers I have running around the, the country. We use our postal police to protect our facilities, where our people are and the mail is, and I don't have enough of that. I'm stepping up the action on that. There are places where we have 1,000 people and no security. Uh, so that's where we're trying to re redirect it, but I will read the bill, and, uh, uh, but I have, uh, 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 you're, you're right, there's a legislative requirement that, that we cannot you know, patrol the streets. And Do you think that it remains a problem? I think, that, I think that crime in the city streets doesn't... No, I'm talking about crime against your employees, yes, your so civil servants. Yeah. They're being assaulted, are they not? They, they, they are. We are taking significant out. We, go into, we send our inspectors into cities. We partner with the local police and the local prosecutors, and we, we do... We, we Ms. Do. Hull, do you think that the Postal Service is doing enough? As you mentioned, we did the work and issued the report in September. We identified some additional things that the Postal Service could do to address the mail theft issue. We did not specifically address the Postal Police um, problem because we wanted to see more locally what was happening locally in various locations. We, we followed up. We were just finishing up some work in Queens. We're going to do some work around the country in different local areas to see what the problem really is because, again, kind of depends on each each location where the the real hot spots are and what solutions might be available there isn't better law enforcement key it is and and that's actually one of the things that we talked about in that in that higher level uh work and so some of it um there's there's local partnerships that are critical to this as the postmaster general mentioned but we're we're looking into whether what the postal police situation is when we do the local work thank you Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Carper, you're recognized for your questions. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, uh, one and all. Thank you for uh, your service to uh, our country and, and some of you in a variety of ways. People say to me, why have I over the years been so interested in uh, postal service? And it actually goes back to the Vietnam War uh, when uh, my generation, a lot of folks in my generation were serving in Southeast Asia. And the, uh, the, we would fly 12 army missions off the coast of Vietnam. And, uh, uh, and about once a week after we're flying, we'd come back and have chow with our crew and call it a day. And, but once a week, the mail came. It was the best day of the week. And uh, I still have, uh, and for others, uh, veterans who served in a war, and including that war, uh, you know how uh, important it was to stay in touch with your family and friends uh, back home. And uh, the Postal Service did a great job. Uh, I, have, uh, I want to make sure that the Postal Service has what it needs to continue to do a good job, not just for people in, in a war situation or a dangerous situation around the, the, the world, but to right here at home in all 50, all 50 states. Um, I was uh, proud of... Um, a lot of the work that uh, this committee did in the 117th uh, Congress, happy to be a part of that in order to uh, enact the Bipartisan Postal Service Reform Act, uh, which a number of you provided input to, and we appreciate that. Uh, but uh, provided nearly 50 billion, with a B, 50 billion dollars in financial relief for the Postal Service over about, I think, about a decade. The law repealed the burdensome pre-funding mandate for postal workers, retiree benefits, something that I tried to do for years. And under the leadership of this guy right here, we, uh, we, got, it, uh, we got it done. But that, uh, the idea of doing that is the right thing to do, but also to help put the Postal Service on a more solid financial foundation and ensure it can fulfill its vital role for generations to come. Starting this year, the uh, Postal Service and the Office of Personnel Management are launching the, the new Postal Service Health Benefits Program for postal employees, for postal retirees, and for their families, which will help uh, people integrate their health care with Medicare, something that uh, needed to be done. 
uh, it will be a significant feat for the Postal Service and for OPM to implement this uh, new program. And uh, Mr. Joy, with the first open season beginning later this, I think later this fall, mm -hmm. um, can you uh, please speak to how the Postal Service and OPM are beginning to prepare or are preparing for this transition? And does the Postal Service feel well equipped to offer enough customer support to employees and to retirees through this transition in partnership with OPM? Yeah, so I, I paid a visit over to the OPM director's office and met with the staff there uh, maybe seven, eight months ago. Can you bring that microphone closer to you? I, I paid a visit over there about seven, eight months ago to uh, have a kickoff uh, discussion and then brought the, the OPM team uh, later to meet with our deputy postmaster general, who's also our chief human resources officer, and they have been working together on the details of this transition, uh, 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 you know, since that particular point in time. And uh, my, my updates are that everything is moving along uh, well. A little, uh, 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 you know, some change, some potential opportunities in the selection process that we afford the people that, uh, uh, you know, sign up uh, for, for Medicare. But all of that from, from my uh, readings and, and ex uh, what I'm being informed is, is moving, you know, nicely along and we'll be ready to, to, to implement. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to uh, shift a little bit and talk a bit about uh, shifting consumer uh, preferences. Uh, the Postal Service's highest revenue generating mail class uh, has been first class for as long as I can remember. We've seen, as you know, uh, dramatic uh, drops in volume over the years, in part because people have like credit cards in their wallets and we use credit cards to buy stuff and actually pay our bills and, 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 and so forth. But uh, since uh, 2006, first class mail volume has dropped by about 50, a little over 50%, 53% to be exact, reaching the lowest volume, I think, since 1968 when I first deployed to Southeast Asia all those years ago. It's evident that the Postal Service must adapt to shifting consumer preferences to ensure its financial uh, sustainability and its ability to compete with the private sector. The Postal Service has always worked with the private sector companies in order to prepare mail and packages. While the Postal Service has historically excelled at last mile delivery, as you know, private sector competitors are continuing to expand, they're continuing to innovate, and in many ways have outperformed the Postal Service in getting mail and packages to customers efficiently and at lower costs. My question, Mr. DeJoy, is given this trend, could you elaborate for us on the Postal Service's strategy of diversifying revenue streams to better align with today's customer preferences? And what initiatives or partnerships are being pursued to capitalize on opportunities to bring the Postal Service up to par with private sector competitors, competitors and ultimately provide uh, better service to your customers? Well, I, I think that you're hitting on the, 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 the key point. Uh, mail volume dropped, prices didn't, got cut in half, prices didn't rise, and we had an expansive network to, to continue to, uh, uh, an ineffective network to continue to make the deliveries along the standards that we, we have. The Deliver for America plan is trying to make that network resemble a FedEx or UPS type network, still reach its standards in five days, and integrate the mail and package movement together uh, you know, to, you know, to delivery. We had three different networks in the package in, in, in our business. I'm collapsing it to one. And we had a co competitive network that was running around our network getting to our delivery units. Uh, uh, we didn't have products that properly matched what the, consu what, what the consumer uh, wanted and didn't create either operational leverage or, or revenue leverage. We introduced a new product uh, back in July, uh, a ground advantage, which enabled us to take packages that are over one pound in the same, net, you know, in the same network as a first class network. We're seeing 450% growth in that volume. We did 133 million packages more, less, less peak than we did the year before. And there's other, other, it, other methodologies of integrating and preparing us to reach our last mile, the most magnificent part of the Postal Service, the last mile delivery center, uh, the last mile delivery you know, route system. Uh, and we're trying to effectively reach that with a streamlined, cost-effective, product-oriented 
uh, 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 service and affordable pricing. And I believe we can, uh, we're, I think we're on our way to, uh, to capitalize on that. And that's going to be our, our, our growth of revenue. I've, I have, besides taking $5 billion out of cost over the next two years, I have a 3 to $4 billion revenue goal in the package, in the package business. All right. Thank you. Do, am I done? Don thank you. Uh, I think it's a Sen wrap. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Senator uh, Lossoff, I'll recognize you for your questions, and also I need to step out to vote real quick. I'll uh, hand the gavel to you until I return. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. DeJoy, core job of the Postal Service is to deliver mail and packages on time, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Are mail and packages being delivered on time in Georgia today? No, sir. Why not? We have had uh, significant issues in terms of transitioning from 11 plants in the Atlanta area into three. Excuse me, could, could you speak into the microphone, yeah. please? We've, we've, we've taken on a big, tra Atlanta has been one of our worst, uh, the Georgia area has been one of our worst served areas over the last 10 years, uh, mostly because we had uh, 10, 12 different locations around the Atlanta area. Mr. Joe, I don't want to talk about the last 10 years. I want to talk about the last three months. All right. Well, we do, you, do you know, mm -hmm. since you made this shift to the new Palmetto facility, mm -hmm. what percent of outbound first-class mail was delivered on time in Atlanta? It's, it's a significantly lower number. Yeah, 66%. Do you know what share of inbound mail, first-class mail, is delivered on time? It's probably all a day late. So. Take, a, take a guess how much of it's on time. 35%? You're, you're pretty much there. 36%. Mm -hmm. 36% mm -hmm. of the mail is being delivered on time to my constituents. What is the specific nature of the operational failure? Uh, well, the specific nature of the operate, we had to move 2,000 people from all these different plants into one location. We have strict requirements as to when they move. It's a big facility that we opened up. We have inbound transportation issues. Uh, 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 yeah, but you knew it was going to be hard and complicated, right? Yeah, and we tried to phase it in over, se several, over several months, which we did. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to fix it. Uh, you're absolutely when? When right. When is it going to be fixed? I, I, you will start seeing service improve. Over, you should see it start now, and I think we'll get to where we need to be in about 60 days. Do you think that one of your private sector competitors would have rolled out yeah, I a think new, they excuse, the hold on a second, Mr. Mm -hmm. Joy. A new system that would reduce on-time delivery to 36% and then say it's going to take months to fix it? Months? Private businesses and ta taking on operations of this nature with the, with the resources that, that we have do, in fact, have these types of problems. You, okay. you, don't have, you don't have months to fix 36% of the mail being delivered on time. Yes. I've got constituents right. with prescriptions that aren't being delivered. I've got constituents who can't pay their rent and their mortgages. I've got businesses who aren't able to ship products or receive supplies. I wrote you on March 14th. Did you get my letter? Uh, my office probably. My office got well, I didn't write your office. I wrote you. Did you receive my letter? I have not read your letter. You haven't read my letter. I tried to speak to you Friday or, or, or yesterday. You haven't read my letter. I have. The mail's I, not on time in Georgia. I'm a member of the committee with, of jurisdiction. You haven't read my letter. Well, that explains why I haven't received well, a response to my letter. March 14th, I wrote you with two specific questions. What update can you provide regarding the aforementioned reported issues at the Atlanta Regional Processing and Distribution Center in Palmetto? Question one. Question two, how is USPS currently communicating with customers in the metro Atlanta area reporting delayed and lost packages? You haven't read the letter? So, sir, letters come in. Uh, people put, they put stuff to, to, together to answer okay. it and get you, you, let me Let me just give you yeah. uh, just a friendly piece of advice. You should, you should personally read letters mm -hmm. from members of the U.S. Senate Committee right. that funds and oversees your operations, particularly where you are failing abysmally to fulfill your core mission mm -hmm. in my state. And let me be clear, I think postal workers are out there every single day working their hearts out to deliver the mail on time. But if they don't have the infrastructure and the management competence overhead them to make a transition like this without drastically impairing the core function of the Postal Service, everyone in my state is losing. You, the amount 
of distress this is causing my constituents in massive is massive and i want to know what you are going to do what specific steps you are going to take to fix this within two weeks so we have engaged over 50 different management executives on on site we've we're work we are f finishing up our staffing at all the th at the remaining three locations we are looking at our truck schedules we revamping our truck schedules uh, we are stabilizing the operation in terms of uh, uh, our, our machinery that's, that's work that we have deployed there. We are working better on our, we have special teams down on, on site on uh, working on our docks and we're working the rest of the transportation uh, uh, aspects of this that are causing a significant amount of problems. And the two plants where we did a lot of transfers with, by uh, within the next uh, 10 days we should have them fully staffed. Uh, we had uh, uh, issues in terms of those transfers, so the team is working, yeah. working very hard. And I can assure you that in the long in the long run, right, that you will have the, uh, probably the best service in the we, country. No, the, the long run is is too long. You've got weeks, what, not months. I, you've I got I weeks, say, not months, well, to fix this. And if you don't fix it, thirty six percent on time delivery. I don't think you're fit for this job. I yield okay. to Senator Butler. Thank you, you Chair, and I appreciate the uh, advocacy on behalf of your uh, Georgia constituents. Thank you all um, uh, for being here and for your effort. Postmaster DeJoy, I, I, you, I heard you say something. I wrote it down um, during your exchange with Senator Lankford, and I just want to give you the opportunity to help, just help me understand uh, what you meant. You said, coming up on an election, I expect we'll slow down. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Well, all the activity that we have in terms of transitioning, the transition activity. I, I wanted to, to understand that because, you know, as a, a state having 40 million constituents um, that has moved to um, all male ballot is concerning to me. I really want to understand what your plan is. And I, I know California is not the only state. Um, where uh, voters are expecting to get their ballot in the mail. My mother is actually a constituent of Senator Ossoff's and just this past election cycle did not get her ballot, her mail-in ballot, uh, actually on time, forcing her to go and have to stand in line for three hours uh, to vote in person. And so I'd like to understand uh, your plan um, for what voters should expect uh, from the Postal Service relative to uh, this upcoming election season. The, postal, the voters should accept the same good service that they have gotten in every election. Over 98, 99% of, mail of, of ballots get turned around within two or three days. Uh, we've issued reports every year. I've put together uh, a specific infrastructure within the organization that works with all election boards throughout the year. Um, uh, and we deploy extraordinary measures during election time where we uh, uh, run extra trips, we put extra people on site, we have special oversight uh, uh, areas, uh, you know, uh, departments within each area of the, of the election. And you should expect the same good service we've been delivering for the last, uh, since I've been here. Thank you uh, for, for that. I, I just have to note, and I want to, I will be, continue with my line of question, but I just have to note there is a, um, an acceptance of exclusion that um, continues to sort of show up in your testimony um, and your engagement. When you were speaking with Senator Rosen, there was an acceptance of 10% of Nevadans not getting their mail on time and an acceptance of uh, 30, only 30% 30 percent of Atlanta residents getting their mail on time. And now we're talking about an acceptance of 2% of uh, our country's voters not getting their ballots on time. So I just want to note uh, a uh, trend uh, and uh, move forward. And I ask, I think I'm going to raise two parts of California that probably have never been spoken in a Senate hearing. One. Uh, is a town uh, called Bridgeport, California, in the county of Mono. Um, Bridgeport uh, has um, been the only post office in, in uh, this town for a while, uh, is the only uh, post office in this town. Uh, and since February 2023, the post office has essentially been, the facility has been 
unusable. Now, I may not agree with um, uh, a, a number of the political issues and, and positions that my colleague, Congressman uh, Kylie, might um, put forward. But he and I are trying to engage, and have been trying to engage uh, your team uh, to figure out how is it that for now all more than a year, there has been a facility that's been unusable by a water pipe burst that followed a disastrous snowstorm. It wasn't until Congressman Kiley was urging your office uh, and reminding you that, that these, this facility was not in service that you were then sending out four trailers. So talk to me about how the voters in Bridgeport, California can expect the same uh, good service that they have been getting from you when the same good service for last year uh, plus has been a non-functional facility that at this point is operating out of trailers. Yeah. Well, we have 31,000 centers around the country and $25 billion worth of deferred maintenance uh, uh, you know, in, in them. And it's, it's, it's problems in, in many towns uh, across and we're working uh, we have deployed uh, one of the more uh, uh, expansive re refurbishment uh, 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 investment strategies that the Postal Service has seen. I, I understand, year. and you have put forth, I, I think you, uh, you have, I've listened to you talk about the incredible efforts that you have made to overcome challenging situations as you walked into uh, your position and leadership uh, of the Postal Service, and a lot of it um, I, I truly believe is to, to be commended. I am trying to ass assess what kind of service I can talk with the folks in Bridgeport well, that doesn't. they should expect given that the facility that has been serving them is uh, less than uh, to be expected from a United States Postal Service facility for the last year. Mm -hmm. For the last year, and here we are, as you noted, coming up on an election season in a state where the ballots are 100% by mail. Mm -hmm. Let me move from, from Bridgeport and Mono County to the folks, uh, great Californians down in Imperial. Uh, Imperial is one of our most southern uh, states, uh, uh, counties in the state of California. And in February of 2022, maybe it's just the month of February in California, but in February of 2022, a fire uh, rendered again the only post office in the town of Nyland, small, majority low income community inoperable. After the fire, the Postal Service put out a notice to say that the post office would be closed temporarily and that the office would reopen as soon as it was safe to do so. Mr. DeJoy, would you be surprised to know that two years later it's still not safe to do so? No. Why is that acceptable? It's, it's not acceptable and these are some of the initiatives that we're trying to roll out and fix. If you give me uh, I'll, my staff will have written, wrote down and I'll get back to you as to what the, I'll look into what the strategies are for that location. Again, it's, we have uh, um, a massive uh, uh, a quantity of, under, of you know, poor conditions in many of the post offices around the country. I understand, but these are not, I, I don't, I'm not going to assert what the condition of these facilities were prior to these incidents. Yeah. You and your team know that better than, than I. But February of 2023, there was a pipe that burst. We are in April of 2024, and it is not functioning to serve the people of Mono the County. The post office is closed. And the post office is running out of four trailers. Four trailers. Mm -hmm. February of 2022, a fire happened. Again, I'm not asserting that this okay. is a part of deferred maintenance obligations. These are incidents that have happened. And you know the residents of California are about to run into uh, an election season where all of the ballots are delivered by mail. And they don't have any confidence that they're already not getting their um, prescriptions on time. They're already not getting all of the other you know, conditions that, that really um, emanate from um, center closures. And Mr. Chair, I'm running over and I wanna, I wanna be quick. But I, I do feel like, um, again, there is just, I, I hear you about deferred maintenance. These are incidents that happen and we are too 
uh, and three years past those incidents, and nothing is being done to, that I can tell uh, to, in, to ensure that the service is restored to the level of good that you said that folks should expect with this uh, election season coming up. So I appreciate, again, the effort that you are making, the, the work that you are implementing in, in your Deliver for America plan, but there are some Americans that are not getting it delivered, and I think we have to do better. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Hawley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DeJoy, nice to see you. Um, I want to talk to you about the post office facility in Bering, Missouri. Back in August of this last year, the post office there was closed after severe tornado damage. Missouri is, is uh, right in sort of tornado alley. It has not reopened since then. So in September, I, I wrote to you asking about a timeline to, to have uh, the post office reopened. Your office wrote back uh, later that month and said probably 90 days there would be a, a timeline announced. We didn't hear anything, so in January, I wrote again with the chairman, actually Chairman Peters. We wrote asking about a timeline. I don't think I've gotten a response to that letter. Here's, here's the, the Bering Post Office at the moment. Um, it doesn't exist. So this, this community, this is a rural community in my state, they don't, they don't have a, a post office at all. And what, what bothers me is I haven't heard anything about the, the timeline for getting it rebuilt. So can I just ask for an update on that? Yes. Do you, do you have one? I, don't, I do not have an update on the bearing. I'm sorry. I, I do not have one, but I will get, get it to you. Okay. Can we, can we get one? I, I, I don't want to belabor the point here, but because I think we've heard it now from, from multiple people, but in rural Missouri, you know, this community, I mean, you see it. There's no post office here. They can't get, they, they can't get prescription drugs. They can't get their bills on time. They can't get any. I mean, they're just stranded. So um, I'm frustrated here by the fact that it's been months and months, and I was told 90 days in September, and this is now the middle of April, and here we are. So I'd, I'd like to get your help on this uh, for these good folks. Um, let me ask you then about uh, some delivery issues. In the Kansas City area, we have seen a tripling of casework reports in Kansas City, folks are saying they're just not getting the mail. I mean, they're not getting it on time. It was so significant, I asked the, the Inspector General to look into it and to recommend uh, some, some action items to improve this. I mean, I just had constituents telling me that the end of March, they're finally getting their Christmas cards. I mean, this is not good. And uh, this has happened in Kansas City. It's also, frankly, happening in St. Louis on the other side of the state. So can you just give me an, an update on the implementation of, of uh, the Inspector General's recommendations for improving service in Kansas City, or maybe, and or maybe you know something about the, the Kansas City situation, and, and it would be helpful to hear. Can't, can't, the, as I actually, we, I don't know where I report, but uh, right before peak season, we had a major uh, transportation contractor go out of business. They had a big transfer hub in. Kansas City, it actually had eight that we had about 5,000 truckloads of mail and packages going in and out of these places. So we had to distribute that around quickly over several weeks, around 20 locations around the nation, and reroute 5,000 truckloads in and out. Uh, Kansas City was, was not great on service to begin with, uh, and this just complicated the uh, 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 you know the, the the issue is starting to re starting to recover on it, and I think uh, you should uh, see gradually improving service in the area. Well, good. I mean, I hope it'll be more than gradual. It's it is. I mean, I don't. I know I don't need to tell you this, but it's just incredibly frustrating for folks not to be able to get their mail and to have it go on for for months and months. And and uh, it's the Kansas City area. I'm getting a lot of complaints out of the St. Louis area. So I, I, this is just it's it's got to be a priority. I want to ask you to. Be sure to to tell all of the postal workers how grateful I am for them. I know that they're doing hard, hard work. Uh, I'm proud of the work that they're doing, and uh, we rely on them. You know, my state, my gosh, we rely on them. We're a, we're a majority rural state, so you know, places like Bering, little town where I grew up, Lexington, other places. Boy, we we are grateful for our postal workers, and we are grateful for our post offices. And uh, I know something the chairman and I talk about a lot. We don't want to see post offices closed in rural parts of, of this country, and uh, we want to see the mail delivered on time. So please thank them uh, for me for all that they're doing, and uh, thank you for your attention to these uh, to these issues. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Hawley. 
So I'm going to get back to the rural. You've heard a lot about rural uh, places uh, uh, from my colleagues here, and we're, we're certainly seeing uh, changes that are impacting us uh, in, in Michigan, particularly in the Upper Peninsula, which is about as rural as you can get. Uh, and folks up there, just like they do all over the country, rely on timely delivery for the mail. One, one particularly important thing that's occurring right now in the UP is uh, testing drinking water for uh, bacterial uh, contamination. And that requires one day delivery. When you take those samples and send it off to the lab, it has to get there uh, in an incredibly timely way for it to be a, a valid uh, test. Uh, that has become an issue uh, for us in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, we also know, uh, as uh, all of you know, uh, uh, veterans uh, need access to their medication. They get that uh, primarily from mail service. Uh, and uh, uh, and that uh, has to be a continued focus for the Postal Service to make sure that those meds are, are getting to our veterans on time. We had a uh, we had a uh, a hearing uh, uh, or over that the postal service had because of some changes in the UP, and actually postal officials were unaware uh, that we had a, a VA facility uh, in the Upper Peninsula, which was somewhat uh, striking uh, that they would not be aware. The VA facility is incredibly important to veterans who live in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, Postmaster uh, uh, General DeJoy, the uh, uh, I know that the Postal Service has not uh, announced uh, a number of changes uh, to the transportation policy in several locations, uh, but we found out recently it was being implemented uh, in Michigan. So my question for you is why, why weren't communities notified uh, before these changes, uh, be before they're rolling out? Why, why isn't there more transparency so that they know what's happening? So you can pull your microphone closer too, please. Yeah. Uh, the, the trans uh, we make a lot of different transportation changes. I'm trying to think about which, if you're talking about the one day issue or just a local transportation optimization. Local part of the network changes. Yeah, because it, it's not intended to have any difference in service standards, right? We run too many trucks with no mail in it all over the, all over the country. And the whole process is to, um, um, you know, try and optimize that so we can uh, cut our costs. I have to get a billion and a half dollars out of local transportation. Uh, the intention of all these initiatives when these items are rolled out are not, on not to have a, a consequence, right, within the standards. The standards are, you know, two to five days. Um, and uh, we have, uh, um, um, we, have, we're delivering 60% of the mail and packages across the country a day in advance, right? So we're trying to take advantage of that cushion that has been built in to make sure uh, that uh, uh, we can optimize our, our, our freight. So we did not, think, I mean, to the, we didn't change collection box times. We didn't change anything. The mail sits in the system from the time we get it somewhere in the postal system across the country, whether it's, uh, so that, that is the essence of the change. It wasn't expected to have an impact. And I don't think in the Upper Peninsula we've had much of an impact on service. So my last check was that for the most part, everything was uh, running pretty smoothly. Yeah, we uh, obviously folks will bring issues up. We look at data. I look at data as well. Yeah. Uh, and one data point that I think is something we have to be really focused on because there's a great deal of concern of people in the Upper Peninsula, similar to what you heard from my uh, colleague uh, from Nevada, uh, is that uh, the Postal Service, as my understanding, is considering a facility change that would mean local mail uh, going to from uh, to and from UP residents, uh, but going out of state into Wisconsin instead of the facility mm -hmm. that you have in the Upper Peninsula. Mm -hmm. We think that's going to likely slow mail. So, but my question for you is: Are you measuring the impact of that, these changes yeah. on rural so, service so uh, that we can roll it back if it's having that impact? Because yeah, the so, folks, so I look at we all look at the whole organization looks at sir it looks at service i've instituted new quality programs across the organization and and so forth our intentions are to make the service on all these moves and in fact it is doable with the proper execution of the of the of of, of the strategy uh we with regard to that particular move as i said it's not being dismissive of 10 percent of the people it's all of that, the other 90% has to get to a central point to be collated to go across the country. I can't collate th these collations that are done at every one of these little locations to get 10% of the mail out to go back. It's another step when we get to uh, the location, makes reduces the density of trays, increases the, 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 the under, underutilization of our, our trucks. 
this mail should make it wherever we send it to. I don't know exactly where this is going, but it's full intention to come in, to schedule, to, to uh, do, do uh, outgoing processing on it, postmark it, cancel it, and turn around the next morning and get back. We have a two-day standard to get back. All of this is planned out to work. There are lots of issues in execution that will be, that the, the team is learning how to make these types of changes. Uh, 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 they have not been under the pressure to perform at, at a level that they that, that we need to and using the new equipment and perform to a schedule and make these changes. But um, I'm confident we we will get there, and I'll take a special eye on on all the all of these these small moves. Should as they're not as consequential of some of the bigger things we did in Richmond and and Atlanta. These are these are these are just taking the outgoing mail, routing the trucks to a you know consolidating, routing to a different plant, and putting it through the normal process. People are already in place, turning it around and sending it back down on the trucks. So we think this is going to be uh, you know not consequential in the deployment. And well, I'm not well, gonna, well, I yeah. hope so. I mean, yeah. what we're seeing though in Richmond, Atlanta. Uh, for 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 very obvious reasons, uh, uh, is a is a red flag for yes. us. Yeah, uh, and, and again, I'm I'm coming to you not as someone against change because you have to change and you have to become yeah. more efficient, but change also creates challenges uh, as to actually the implementation. Um, uh, Mr. Kubayanda, you you talked about the uh, advisory opinions that the commission has to just kind of take a little bit of a pause to take a look at and talk to stakeholders around. I think. Uh, uh, you know, what what is what are your concerns specifically? Could 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 the commission do one of these advisory opinions, and what what do you think uh, we would learn from that? Uh, yes, Senator, I, I believe an advisory opinion um, uh, is very valuable and is merited uh, at this time as the Postal Service ramps up this rollout of. Uh, DFA with the uh, RPDCs and uh, also the optimized collection. I think combined, um, those are creating a, an, uh, what's likely to be a nationwide impact on service, and we do think an advisory opinion is appropriate. Um, in, uh, as I mentioned, in previous advisory opinions in 2021 and 2022, uh, the Commission identified a number of concerns as the Postal Service um, started to implement some changes. Those concerns included um, over, overly optimistic estimates about cost savings, uh, lack of communication to stakeholders, potential impact on rural constituents, potential impact on veterans, um, and, and others receiving uh, medications uh, through the mail. Uh, all these have come to fruition. Um, they, we've seen the um, we've seen this in the data. We've seen this in the um, in, in the constituent complaints. Uh, we've seen this in um, the Inspector General's uh, recent reports. Um, so I think uh, th that advisory opinion process has a lot of value, and we, uh, we, we believe that the advisory opinion uh, would be timely right now. So Postmaster General DeJoy, when, when, when I, uh, in my original round of questions uh, and raised uh, the concerns, and you came back and said, no, you know, we're willing to slow things down to make sure that it's all operating correctly, because you... You're, you're, you're success focused. I've, I've grown to know you over the, uh, the months here. It seems as if an advisory opinion, slow down, have an advisory opinion to kind of take a look at this while you're continuing to work on making sure that both Richmond yeah. and Atlanta are performing. That's going to be your, your end of the argument. That's the drop the mic moment when Richmond and Atlanta are performing better. They're coming in below cost. The mail delivery services are still there. While you're doing that, also taking a broader look at the impact. Would, would you be open to this advisory opinion? Is this something that would give you a fresh I, I, I set of eyes? I want to discuss with council, but we're in the process of considering an advisory opinion with regard to things that we feel are uh, uh, magnanimous changes to to the to, to the to the op, to the male community, okay. Uh, uh, and are working through what, in fact, we would ask an advisory opinion for. Okay, and uh, it's a broad things to try and baseline what I, you know, so that that's what we're working through right now, right, um, and have been working through over the last six or six or eight weeks. But Senator, I, I just what what we're doing well, before you before yeah, you, you I'll yeah. give you time to answer that. But so, what kind of timeline do you think that you've been doing it for six weeks now? When would when would that determination, what would, it, it would the could context be? be? It could be, I, I would have to take it to the board. It could be this board meeting, or it could be the, the, a special board meeting afterwards, is what we would 
Well, it would be great do. if it could be the upcoming one and yeah, uh, show yeah. the urgency. We're, we're, we're working on it. We have to figure out what, you know, exactly it is that we want, because I don't want to do this again. I kind of have a good understanding of what the infrastructure looks like. I don't understand what issues are not making this uh, connect, and I still, we still plan to, to deploy a, a, you know, a, 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 a very good service. But let me just, let me just, if I can. Yes, you can finish. Opening up a facility within five miles of 10 facilities, okay, and putting the right equipment and tools and amenities in it, there's nothing, that's what we're doing across the country. There's nothing, there's nothing magnanimous about that, right? Our, our inability to execute comes from a long period of time of not executing change in a, in a, in a, in a construction matter. And the, you know, those, those types of issues, right, uh, how to load a truck, <laughs> when to load a truck, trucks running late, all of that have been issues within the Postal Service that I try, have been, we've been working to change since, we, uh, you know, since, I, since I got here. And we're making progress on it. So it's, it's important to recognize that it's, the strategy is pretty straightforward. Right, we're not, you know, we're, we're, I'm in fact investing in more facilities. I'm opening old facilities that were closed to bring bring different services close with the sorting and delivery centers close, closer to the communities. We're adding capacity, right? We're teaching our people and so forth. But the fact, the pace that we need to change because we can do all these things, we could not. I could avoid those critiques, all these critiques, like everyone before me did. Right, and we'll continue down the spiral, you know, to uh, where everything is much, much worse and much, much broader than what it is today. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. but that is what we're. There's nothing with regard to the plan. It has to do with our execution of it, and we are working on that. And that will, uh, you know, that will, will will get better. But this is where we are on the on the 360. And uh, yeah, and, I, and again, uh, I'm, and I'm I'm all about data, uh, and I'm all about how changes need to be made. And execution has to be there. So uh, this is a really complex, uh, uh, complex uh, situation. I know you walked into this as well, but we still, you are a data person as well as I've gotten to know you that we want to look at the data. The data does not look great it in Richmond. It looks really terrible in Atlanta. You can change that narrative pretty dramatically by showing those numbers are, are changing. And I think you could agree that a lot of folks get nervous when you see those kinds of numbers and you're like, why are we going to continue to roll this out? That's not saying it can't work. It may very well work, but you just need to demonstrate that. And when you demonstrate that, people will get on board and that'll be a, a, great, uh, a great thing. Uh, but we're just saying, let's step back a little bit. Keep working on Richmond and Atlanta. That's going to take time to get that implementation down. You're going to learn a whole lot of lessons. I'm sure that happened in your... You were very successful in the private sector. You did that as well. You didn't want to, to disrupt your customers. You would take time to be able to, to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Having an advisory opinion coming in as well, taking it from a holistic standpoint, just uh, creates more transparency, which builds more trust, because this is about trust. That's the biggest uh, part of it. I would hope that I look forward to seeing what you put forward and, and, on the advisory committee. I think that's uh, very, very, very positive. Uh, but just to be clear, we have been answering from the, from the chairman Dozens and dozens of questions. Every week, we get questions from the Postal Regulatory Commission about what it is we're doing, where every post office is in the country, and other types of things. And we've been submitting, we've been submitting information, and the PRC as well. I've briefed the PRC month, quarterly, right, uh, and with regard to what we're, you know, what we're doing. So that it's not that would, and I, oh, you know, I, I can't. I can't think of how to be more transparent. I speak everywhere. We brief people. We 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 have union me. We we, we speak to everybody, uh, you know, all the groups that we we can before we do these things. But yes, I'm you know we will keep, keep you um, uh, posted as to I'll let you know when we in fact decide what we're going to do. Well, well, I, I appreciate uh, your uh, desire to be transparent. So I'm going to make some requests here. Uh, in, in my letters to the Postal Service about your plans, uh, I have asked for several specific sets uh, of information, uh, and we have not received uh, full answers. Uh, specifically, I would like the Postal Service to provide the committee, uh, one, a list of locations the Postal Service plans to change uh, with specific uh, timelines for implementation, mm -hmm. meaning when do you actually intend to make those changes on the ground at these places. Mm -hmm. 
Two, full service data on every location implemented so far, and that means data for every type of facility before and after implementation. And three, uh, documentation for any cost project, uh, projections, impact studies uh, that the Postal Service uh, has uh, uh, conducted. Uh, you know, that, that's just data. Mm -hmm. You must be looking at this. This is stuff, obviously, you're looking at too, I would assume, uh, in your due diligence. We would like to have that uh, from the committee as well. Would you commit to providing that information to the mm -hmm. committee by May 1st? I don't know. Let me get back to the office, sir, and I'll, I'll have uh, uh, Peter get in touch with Annika, and we'll give you a date on that. Is that something you think is doable? May 1st. May 1st. You should have yeah. this information, I suspect, already. Yeah, so uh, let, let me just explain one thing about cost data, right? To drive cost out of the system, we need the system. Well, you, you have yeah. projections. I'm not. Yes. I don't disagree. You need a system, but, but you have. When you make those changes, you're clearly projecting. Just like in private industry, you're going to project profit. You're going to project costs. I, I sent you a letter telling you what I'm trying to get: five and a half billion dollars out of the system. Right? Well, we, yeah. we'd like to have those impact studies. We'll, we'll work with your team to to try to do that. May first. That would be important. And obviously, the other uh, piece of all this, Chairman Martinez. Uh, uh, in your oversight function and the Board of Governors as well. And I'll just end with this kind of question and thought here. Election mail obviously is a very delicate operation uh, for the Postal Service. You've heard some of my colleagues uh, talk about it and it requires a lot of coordination. Uh, my question for you, sir, is uh, before you allow the Postal Service to move forward with the, some of these changes, are you willing to, to stop and, and consider uh, or reconsider potential impacts on election mail if you believe that that is a risk and will you be very open and transparent about that process to make sure that we can count on election mail getting there in a timely way which is essential for our democracy? Our duty of care is basically to stay informed as we do as a board and to provide oversight. Um, we have been very strong on making sure that elections work uh, very smoothly and on time. In uh, August of 2020, when there was a lot of criticism about whether that would happen in November of 2020, the board established a special committee, an election mail committee that was at the time headed by uh, Governor Moak, to make sure that everything would work and was coordinated uh, with management to make it sure that the election worked smoothly, and it did. After I became chair, we made the special committee permanent and now it's a standing committee of the board, and that's chaired by Governor McReynolds, who's an expert on election matters. Uh, she meets regularly with management. There's a special task force in management dedicated to election mail performance. So we will be on top of this. Uh, we don't want to come back here in January or February, although my term expires in December, and face you and say, hey, it didn't work. Uh, you, you can be assured that we're going to be on top of it. I cannot make assurances ahead of time of what we would do or not do because it would be, frankly, uh, uh, non prudent. Very good. Good. Well, I hope that's the case and uh, appreciate uh, your, your focus on that. I do appreciate that. You know, I think uh, uh, I speak for everybody on the committee. We want the Postal Service to be successful. Uh, this is just absolutely critical for our country. It's why we were able to get support for the postal reform legislation that uh, passed uh, uh, a while ago. Uh, Postmaster General DeJoy, you were very helpful in getting us to get that passed as well. I appreciate that. Uh, there's other things that we can do legislatively, and we're certainly open uh, to those discussions, uh, particularly related to investments. Uh, those, uh, uh, those are things that need to be looked at. Uh, I will say we tried to do some of those fixes before, and we ran into hurdles to do that, so it's not an easy thing to do. But I do believe it's incredibly important that we do, so I agree with that. Uh, but I'm, I'm just laser focused, as I know all of you are. It's about service. It's about making sure that the American people can count on it. You have a really hard job. You're, you're delivering to every single address in America uh, and providing that connectivity that uh, was a, a vision of Benjamin Franklin. You're living uh, on quite a legacy. The first Postmaster General, Benjamin Franklin, uh, you're living on that legacy to be able to do that. Uh, and we stand ready to help, but we just need more transparency. We need to know what's happening. We want some caution and not just uh, believing that a plan works, uh, but also being able to back that up with data that shows that it's actually happening. And if it's not happening as fast as we like, we're okay with that as long as we're working to try to figure out how to fix it. But we shouldn't necessarily be 
potentially reckless in moving forward with a big change before you've worked out some of the kinks. And when I say kinks, you know, kinks are things like getting medicine on time. It's like getting your test, uh, bacterial test on time to find out if you're drinking water. Uh, is that those are not just kinks; those are significant concerns that people have. And the American people have always relied on the U.S. Postal Service. I want to continue to rely on the U.S. Postal Service for another century or more. Uh, and uh, that's going to require all of us working together, kind of breaking down turf battles and, and fights. Uh, know that I'm about just trying to solve this problem. I know all of you want to solve these problems. Let's do that together. And it really starts with having transparency and having other stakeholders and voices uh, being heard uh, in this process as we move forward. So Senator, thank I, you for I, being I, here. I, if I may add something. Sure. Uh, I can. I can say that the board agrees 100% with the objectives that you have laid out, which are consistent with what the Postmaster General's objectives are. Uh, I would just point out to keep in mind, this huge restructuring is happening at the same time that we've got to deliver service. It's not as if we're doing it from scratch. I get it. Okay? So, so it's, it's difficult stuff. And the statistic that always floors people is we handle daily almost 400 million pieces of mail and packages. The scale of this organization is huge, and that's what we're trying to deal with and change and okay. improve. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're aware of that, uh, and, uh, and steering, changing course is not easy. Uh, I served in the U.S. Navy. Uh, it's a lot different uh, steering a destroyer than an aircraft carrier, so, uh, and you have an aircraft carrier on steroids, uh, basically. So let's, let's work together, uh, but please, uh, Postmaster General DeJoy, please give us this information. It's really important to have that. Uh, and please, let's just look at data and understand data speaks loud, and good data ends up uh, building a lot of trust as well, which is, which is what we need. So with that, again, thank you. For all of you uh, being here today, uh, the record for this hearing will remain open for 15 days until 5 p.m. on May 1st, 2024, for the submission of statements and questions for the record. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned.